welcome to the latest in our Inlet Asia's Expert Insight series. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Joseph Jacobelli, a member of the Advisory Board of Inlet Asia. Joseph has actually been an active member for the past two decades, and he has actually just published a book entitled Asian Energy Revolution, China's Role and the New Opportunities as Markets Transform and Digitize. Hi, Joseph. Lovely to see you again. How are you today? Hi, Melissa. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. So before we talk about your book, Joseph, can you tell us briefly about your 30 year association with the electric power sector in Asia? Sure, in, uh, and I guess in 30 seconds. Um, so, <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Melissa, to you and to all of the Enlit Asia team uh, for inviting me today. It's a great pleasure and great honor. Um, so I'm currently the uh, managing partner of Asia Cleantech Energy Investments which has two principal activities. One activity is a small family office doing uh, indirect and direct investments, equities, et cetera. Uh, the other activity is business development advisory for clients such as a company called Senfura, which is a European clean energy development startup. Um, in terms of my own background, um, after studying Chinese and getting a master's degree in uh, Taiwan, back in the 1980s, um, I moved to Hong Kong. I worked in capital markets as a financial analyst for various uh, investment banks like uh, HSBC, uh, Merrill Lynch, Bear Stearns, which is now defunct. I did that for about two and a half decades. I also worked in uh, senior management for one of Asia's largest utilities. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for the background. Um, so we'll get to the specific questions about the aspects of your book. But first, can you tell me what the motivation was behind writing your book and also its objectives? Sure. So the the rationale is that I've you know being in Asia and having lived the Asia energy story for the last 30 years. Um, once the world started talking about, you know, net zero decarbonization, clean energy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I felt that the focus seemingly was, you know, principally Europe, to some extent the US, especially post Trump. Um, but but Asia did not really come into, into the discussion. And I found that very, very surprising and to some extent frustrating because uh, Asia is at the end of the day of the center of the energy consumption in the world with 50% of, of, of consumption. Um, and then also I noticed that there was a, a quiet uh, but very massive revolution uh, to green and to digitalization. So that was the, the kind of rationale motivation. And the objective was really to provide uh, basic background tools and intelligence for uh, corporates, um, financial institutions, uh, investors and others um, to understand the energy landscape in Asia in general and also uh, principally to identify business and investment opportunities in the region. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, so if I were to play devil's advocate for a moment, um, decarbonization in general and the decarbonization of the energy industry in particular is really a global topic, um, which you touched upon. So for example, many international bodies are discussing this topic. One of the many is International um, Energy, or sorry, Energy Agency, which recently released a detailed report called Net Zero by 2050, a roadmap for the global energy sector. Even within the title, we have the word global. Um, with this in mind, why just the focus on Asia? Um, it, starting with the tough question, um, it, it, it's, it's really, it, it is correct. I mean, decarbonization is global and decarbonization mm. must uh, be global uh, if we're going to get to the net zero targets by 2050, obviously. Um, we, we can't have too many luggers. But again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I felt that Asia was really left out of the glo global decarbonization discourse despite the fact that almost 50% of consumption is here uh, in Asia today. And this is still growing because a lot of uh, the markets that we have are still emerging markets. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna see a very, very sharp ramp up in consumption. So um, I felt that you know Asia deserved uh, its own platform, uh, its own voice. And that's why I decided to focus on Asia. Absolutely. And to your point, I agree with you, but um, yeah, just had to throw that at, at you and see what you would say. Um, so thank you. Uh, fair enough. Could you tell me a little bit about your energy consumption outlook for the region, as well as any other major change to the landscapes of the markets that you discuss in your book? Sure. So in terms of the APEC forecast, so in the book, I've got some, so I've got the book here so I can look up the numbers. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, something like, uh, about almost 10,000 
uh, terawatt hours uh, consumed in Asia were in developing Asia in around about uh, 2200, 2300 being in developed Asia. Now that 9,800, almost 10,000, um, based on my forecast is going to grow at least three times to four times in the next um, three decades. So that's an enormous amount of growth, which means you're going to need a lot more uh, uh, you know, capacity um, and, and the rest. And one of the things that I looked at is, you know, a upside factor and a containment factor. The upside factor is really um, the transport electrification, the principally, obviously, electric vehicles, but we're also talking about buses and trucks and all the rest. Because for a lot of the countries in Asia, if you take, for example, Japan, uh, the, the whole of East Asia, uh, economies like Taiwan and countries like South Korea, um, you know, for them to get oil, uh, it's quite it's quite far away. So it makes a lot of sense for them to accelerate uh, the the electric transport electrification at the very least. Um, mm -hmm. So that's an upside. Uh, if it's if it happens faster, that means that that three to four fold could be, you know, three and a half to four and a half fold. Um, a containment factor is really with energy efficiency. Um, we've all been talking about energy efficiency for for many, many, many decades, um, but uh, you know uh, it really depends on government implementation. I mean, corporates can do something, but corporates need incentives. So in the book, I mentioned some examples about, for example, um, a building. Uh, energy efficiency in buildings, as you know, in places like Hong Kong or Singapore, where you are, uh, buildings consume an enormous amount of energy, right? So mm -hmm. if we ca if if the government comes up with some incentives to cap it, then uh, that would be a containment factor. So I try to talk about the consumption growth, which is enormous, uh, upside one upside factor, and of course there are many other, and one containment factor, and of course there are many others. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so on the subject of electric power sector reform and the liberalization in individual markets, what is the biggest trend that you see there? Um, I think that it, it's very often overlooked. I mean, people know that uh, markets such as Australia, Japan, Singapore, New Zealand are already fully open, fully regulated. There's lots of competition going on uh, in Australia, particularly. It's very, very brutal. Um, for the for the operate the energy supplies there um but there's other markets and one of the markets that is kind of least understood is probably china and china is the biggest electric power market in the world by a significant margin and actually up to now something like 60 to 70 percent of the electricity depending on which region in china is already uh, liberalized so the power producer can directly sell to the end user and that offers an enormous amount of opportunities, the whole ecosystem, including, you know, energy trading, some financial products, um, mm -hmm. uh, like weather derivatives and so on and so forth. So I think, and I think over the next uh, three decades, we're going to see more and more markets. A lot of markets are talking about it uh, and are talking about it more increasingly more seriously, uh, such as, for example, you know, Malaysia potentially and Thailand, some other countries could see, you know, full deregulation over the next two or three decades, just because it makes a lot of sense in my view. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for answering. Um, so in your book, you talk about twin transformations. One mm. is the shift from fossil fuel based electric power generation to clean zero energy sources. The second is about digital energy. So what are the key impacts of these transformations and how do they interact or intersect? Both, okay. I guess. Um... <laughs> Again, in, uh, in, in, in 30 seconds, uh, it, it's, it's a very tough question because actually uh, the, you know, the greening of electricity in Asia is intimately linked with the digitalization of the energy. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you look into, and I know you've spoken to a lot of renewable energy uh, developers or people just involved with the renewable energy, and they will tell you, you know, the, the management of demand was what uh, electric power companies uh, historically use, you know, digital solutions for. Uh, now it's about, uh, you know, how do you manage uh, the electric power grid when there is no wind for, and how do you manage electric power grid when there is no sun? So here, uh, you know, the digital uh, solutions uh, become very, very uh, essential. And this is what we call in front of the meters. So what the grids have access. There's also behind the meters, which is what you know, basically consumers, uh, what you do at home with the energy and with AI plus IoT plus blockchain solutions, all of that can become a lot more 
efficient. And if that is able, if all of that um, data can be grabbed by the power distributor, the energy supplier mm -hmm. so, or suppliers, then the whole thing can be managed uh, much better. So I'm trying to simplify it. Uh, but to me, you know, the greening of Asia and digitalization is very intimately linked mm -hmm. and accelerating. <laughs> Thank you. In a nutshell, thank you very much. Uh, so my final question is about the last chapter of your book, which is all about financing. So could you tell me very briefly what was your main takeaway here, um, which is for the audience? Yeah, um, I think that um, you know financial institutions have been trying to make uh, the whole you know green finance, uh, whether it's green bonds, green lending, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, extremely complicated. Now there is a real issue, which is what is green. So there is a terminology or taxonomy issue which needs to be resolved. And in the book, I argue that over the next you know probably five, um, that over the next ten years, but probably pro definitely over the next ten years, but uh, probably over the next five years, that those uh, definitions are going to become a lot more uniform as you know what is green, what is brown, um, how how is it uh, addressed, um, and a lot of these um, plain what I call plain vanilla financial solutions like a bond. Now, a, a green bond at the end of the day is a bond. It's just a bond with some parameters, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then the sustainability uh, targets link or sustainability linked um, bonds. Again, it's the same thing. It's just, just a normal bond, but with some parameters. Um, but right now, that world is very, very complex for the average corporate average business to really uh, understand very quickly get 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 your head around very quickly so what i think is going to happen in the next few years uh you're going to have you know more uniformity in terms of definitions more clarity in terms of what's green what's not green um all of these esg tick the box you know uh have you met this criteria that criteria that's going to be a lot more simplified a lot more transparent going forward so it's going to be accessible for everybody you want to make it accessible for the huge market capitalization company but also to the to the small guy right to the person uh, maybe developing a five megawatt uh, solar plant um, so in order to do that i think the the whole financial market is going to to evolve there will be some new financial products um and in the book i talk quite a bit about tokenization so you know instead of having for example a five million dollar project or ten million dollar project which is very small very difficult for it to uh, to get uh, financing. Uh, it's too small to be big and too big to be small. Um, and and so what happens is, you know, if you can tokenize either the revenue or the asset itself, then all of a sudden you sell into small chunks. You can do something quasi kind of crowdfunding, but maybe crowdfunding for professionals. So that I, the the book also talks about you know the potential for tokenization as one of the new financial tools which will be necessary for the greening and digitalizing of the energy in Asia. Wonderful. Well, I have to say, Joseph, it was really interesting chatting with you today. Thank you so much. Congratulations again on the book. That's a great, mm -hmm. um, great thing to accomplish. Um, and also thank you to our Inlet community for watching. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> um, we hope you enjoyed Joseph's insights given today. And to learn more, be sure to pick up the, his book, which he just showed. You can show it again if you like. <laughs> in stores now. Awesome. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you.